What's good, y'all? We back with another video. We got another update in the K Fox situation. His lawyer provided another update, and it's nothing too crazy. It's mostly on the legal side. What's going on? Why has his court date been getting pushed back? Because if you've been paying attention, his court date got pushed back a couple times already. He is going to court next week. I know there's been a lot of rumors, a lot of social, big social media outlets, been posting that he's not going to court until 2028 which is crazy. I don't know if y'all just don't know anything about the legal system or whatever, but you got the right to a speed trial and they can't just say your next court day is in 2028. That's just not how stuff works. I know the system is messed up, but 2028 is crazy. And it's the only point I really want to hit on before we get into K-Fox lawyer talking. Prosecutor again keeps bringing up like Reddit posts and trying to paint the narrative that K Flock is having his fans attack the prosecutors and doing all this extra stuff. They are doing extra stuff, but that's it's the case sexuals. Like we can't do nothing about it. It's just the diehard K Flock fans. And he brought up again another instance where they brought this YouTube video and it painted this cop as a crazy super cop, which if you know that certain cop he is a super cop. He be harassing a lot of drill rappers. And I know prosecutors probably listening, so I don't want you all to talk too much. But the video painted the cop as a super cop. And he got named in a video and he was saying he was scared for his safety and all this other stuff. Which is what it is. But this is the second instance and probably not the last instance where the prosecutors, I know they get what they get paid for. But they're trying to paint this as k Vlox fans are really going to do what they say on social media. Granted anything can happen but don't try to make it seem like k-flock is sending his fans to hate on the legal system the cops the judges no like k-flock has no control over that he has no phone in jail he's not doing none of that his fans are his fans they're gonna ride out for him either way but at the end of the day prosecutors need to focus on k-flock and k-flock only we all know what they're going to try to do. They're going to try to paint him in a negative light and say his drill music, he really living what he's rapping about and paint the whole picture. He's the demonic drill rapper that did what he said he was going to rap about. There's nothing that us fans can do about it. We can only just watch at this point. All we can ask for is a fair trial. Free K Flock can wait till that day hit. And shout out to Lawyer again. His podcast link is in the description. But y'all me know what y'all think about this down in the comments down below. I'm going to get up to it. Appreciate y'all for rocking with me. Keep doing y'all. Keep doing me. Be safe. Stay dangerous. Good. Now, I promised an update on the Kevin Perez uh, case, uh, the rapper known as K Flock, his murder case in Manhattan. And here it is. Judge Melissa Jackson retired. She retired. And that was a judge that was thought to be very, very pro-prosecution. I liked her. I thought that she was smart. I thought that she was fair. And I thought that she was going to give me a fair shake uh, with Kevin. We have a new judge. Her name is uh, Felicia Menon. And I suspect I'll like her as well. Why? Because I, I like our case. I think we've got a strong defense. Our next court appearance is on November 16th at 100 Center Street in Manhattan. And on that date, we'll argue the prosecutor's motion to delay uh, until jury selection, the disclosure of the names and contact information of its 31 fact witnesses in the case. The reason why they want to not give it to the defense is that they claim that the defendant is part of a gang, or that the defendant shot a man on the street in Manhattan, that the charges are serious, and therefore the witnesses may be in danger or could be intimidated by the defendant or his people. Now, what's frustrating is that the prosecutors first mentioned their claim to need uh, to not provide this contact information and names of their witnesses in early May of this year, June, July, August, September, October, November. that's like six months. But it took until October 17th for them to finally file their motion. For months, it was impossible for the defense to properly investigate the allegations against Kevin. Time was wasted as only one side had access to the most important evidence in the case, the eyewitnesses. In every court appearance in which this issue was discussed, the defense, me, said the same thing. Turn the contact information and names to just the lawyers, and we won't share them with Kevin or anyone associated with him. How else can we defend them at trial if we can't even speak to the witnesses? The first time is going to be when they're, when they're on the stand? How am I going to prevent them from lying? I've got to speak to them or at least investigate them. In this way, by saying that we would take the information ourselves and not pass it to the defendant or his family, we're basically alleviating the prosecutor's concerns. We're not going to share the information. The judge uh, who was in place at the time, Judge Jackson, she reacted positively to that middle ground compromise that we made. As I said, we weren't insisting that we get the names and contact information with no limitation. But they never filed the motion. They kept, there was always one excuse after another. They weren't ready with it. They weren't ready with it. 
The prosecutors pointed uh, to no effort by uh, Kevin to contact any witnesses in the case, to obstruct justice by threatening or intimidating any witness in this case. Instead, they claim that he's dangerous, that he's in a gang, and that they they claim that the case is so high profile, as they noted in their papers, that surveillance video from the crime because it happened on the street and there's a lot of cameras all over the place on the street, that surveillance video had been posted to YouTube and that some anonymous YouTube comment and anonymous people in the courtroom had taken pictures of what happened in court and posted them on social media. Who's to say any of this had to do with with Kevin? There's all kinds of people that come to court. And as I said, one YouTuber posted a video containing a copy of the defendant's arrest warrant and included in the part was an, an officer identified um, uh, who identified the defendant in the surveillance video. And the title of the video named the officer and stated that he would be, quote, a major witness in a murder trial. And as a result, the officer expressed to the DA's office that he had concerns about his safety. I can understand that. The question that jumps out is, what does it have to do with the prosecutor simply providing the witness information just to defense lawyers? Unknown people took pictures in court. Unknown people pointed out that someone in a video was a witness in the case. So that means the defendant doesn't get to investigate the charges against them, which could land him in jail for life. All of this evidence, the names and contact information of witnesses, is discoverable by statute to the defendant. The statute requires us to get it. The prosecutor can then move to deny access to this evidence if they make a showing of good cause to the court. And sure enough, good cause can include, according to the statute, and I'm quoting, danger to the integrity of physical evidence or the safety of a witness, risk of intimidation, harassment, or unjustified annoyance or embarrassment to any person and the nature, severity, and likelihood of that risk. And in making this determination, courts can weigh, quote, the nature and circumstances of the factual allegations in the case, whether the defendant has a history of witness intimidation or tampering, and the nature of that history. Now, we would argue that there is no evidence that Kevin has a history of witness intimidation or tampering with evidence. But the law also states that when weighing these factors in determining whether a protective order can be granted, the court must engage in a discretionary balancing test of all these factors. And even if the court finds that good cause does exist to issue a protective order, the statute makes clear that the court should consider what can be done to remove any of the prosecutor's concerns about their witnesses. And that's what's written into the law. And I'm going to read it to you. This is what's in the law. The court may impose as a condition on the discovery to a defendant that the material or information to be discovered be available only to counsel for the defendant or alternatively counsel for the defendant and persons employed by the attorney to assist in the preparation of a defendant's case. They may not disclose physical copies copies of the discoverable documents to a defendant or to anyone else. That's what the law says. That's exactly what we've been proposing since May when we first learned of the prosecutor's desire to not turn over the names of the witnesses. Somehow, some way, in their 30-page memo of law, not once did they even comment on this middle ground that they know that we've proposed, that we get the information ourselves and not the defendant. Naturally, we, we heavily hit this in our response, which was filed this past week. And in order to make it uh, better for us, I suppose, to, to try to alleviate the prejudice against us, the prosecutors mentioned in their papers that they were unaware of any information regarding the witnesses which are exculpatory, meaning that's either helpful to the defendant or impeaches uh, some of their witnesses, which makes them less believable. And I found this argument particularly bizarre because if you ask a prosecutor if they think there's any evidence in any of their cases which is helpful to the defendant, they'll tell you, of course not. It's they're, they're guilty of everything. They're hardly the proper people to know what I, the defense lawyer, considers to be helpful in defending a criminal defendant, mainly because they've never defended anyone before, and I've only done it a thousand times. All of this will be decided on November 16th. I'll give you an update when that happens. It's a little over a week. And now that we have a judge who is not retiring, I suspect this case will move along faster. And Kevin Perez will have his day in court. And this is a client that I've grown to really like. I've grown to really like his mother, his managers. These are decent people. I know, oh, come on, he's accused of this horrible crime. You know, everybody that I represent is accused of something bad. 
It doesn't mean that I like all of them. But this is, he's been a joy to represent so far. I like him. He's kind. He's polite. There's something about him that I think is eminently likable. And, and, and he doesn't seem to me as an aggressive kid. I understand. I understand what he's charged with. I get it. It doesn't change the fact that he deserves a fair trial. It's all we want is a fair trial.